Once your blood runs orange and blue, orange and blue. 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 this, this is, the pod, is the pod for you. For you. You're listening to Orange and Blue Bloods, hosted by EJ Stewart and Tommy Beer. Let's get to it, New York. Um, all right. Today, we celebrate an iconic moment in Knicks history on this edition of This Week in Knicks History, the dunk. It was 30 years ago on this day, we record on May 25th, that John Starks drove baseline and rose up for a left-handed flush over several Chicago Bulls uh, in Game 2 of the 1993 Eastern Conference Finals. And if you were too young to be there for it or you don't remember it, here is a call from Mr. Mom Albert. We're down to 50 seconds left in the fourth quarter. Starks. Yes. What a move by Starks who was able to sky to the basket. The Bulls call for time. So that bucket from John Starks gave the Knicks a five-point lead late in the fourth quarter to secure that win. The slam, as you heard, sent the Garden crowd into a frenzy, uh, propelled the Knicks to a 2-0 series lead. I get chills listening to that call, just like I got chills listening to the mellow threes uh, from, uh, I guess, Chicago on Easter on 20, in 2012, hearing that call of uh, Marv Robert, hearing that crowd go crazy. Awesome moment. Um, it was, unfortunately, the last game the Knicks would win in that series. However, Chicago would put together four straight wins to advance to their third straight NBA Finals. So let's talk about the dunk. It remains one of the most talked about moments in Knicks history. When you think about the dunk, uh, what memories come to you, Tommy? Oh, man. The, uh, the, the innocence of youth when you could really get invested. I was, uh, let's see, 93, I was probably around 14 years old. Wow. 13 something like that so it was like right in the prime of like when you really get to be a fan and not an yep. adult when you're jaded and cynical yeah. and you know you know I, I, at this at this stage of the game i've been in the locker room after wins and losses and i've kind of seen how the how that sausage is made so to speak um, right. so it's diff- more difficult to just kind of be a a, a mindless fanatic um, but when you're yeah. a te- when you're a teenager, that's when you can really just throw yourself and your personality and you know wear your stuff to school and fight yeah. friends who had you don't talk to your friends who wore bull starter jackets um, <laughs> that week and that month uh, and and just really you know it was just, it was just so much more than a game it it really was um, you know when, when it was when it was just so important um, so I remember watch I remember the dunk I remember going up two and zero. Um, it's hard to imagine for fans that weren't around during that time just how important that rivalry was to um, having Jordan rip your heart out year after year. And it seemed like the Knicks were finally going to get it done. Um, obviously going two up, uh, going up 2-0 in the garden. Um, and, you know, you wanted it for Patrick, you wanted it for Starks. Um, I think the most memorable thing about the dunk is the poster, the dunk. Um, oh, yeah. I, you know, if you're, if you're aged, you know, 35 to 45, 50, um, every Nick fan, every kid had that in their, um, in their bedroom when they were, they had that on their wall. Um, that po- that I have it, uh, in my, in my office. There you right go. Now, right right here. there. That awesome. is, the, that is people the- check out, people who listen on the podcast, go to YouTube and find the video, find this, uh, the poster that Tommy's talking about, because he's you- showing it right now on the podcast. And- and you can't really see it, but there's tape and holes and rips because <laughs> this is the original poster that was in my bedroom um, uh, from 20 years ago, you know, 30 wow. years ago. Now. 30 years ago. Wow. Uh, that's awesome, man. I had it in my bedroom, you know, before, you know, from whenever, when I, you know, from, from eighth grade to high school, went to college, had it in my dorm room, moved to Boston for a few years, had it in my apartment, moved to Queens for a decade had it in my apartment. Um, and now I moved here and I, and I got it up in my office. Um, and I, and I, and I think a lot, I have another signed photo of the dunk by Starks himself. My dad got me, um, maybe wow, 10 years really ago. Awesome. I have that in my basement. So I actually have two, um, the dunk, uh, picture posters up in my home. Um, but yeah, it's just, there's a connection there, um, between the fan base. It's one of the reasons why Starks was so loved. And you talked about guys that played hard, like the, you know, remember Starks was begging groceries three years before, 
um, yep. you know, five years before that play, a, a couple months before, um, you know, he was signed by the Knicks uh, as a training camp invite, um, basically only made the roster because he injured himself trying to dunk on Ewing, um, you know, in, in, in the training camp prior to his, his rookie season with the Knicks. Um, there's, there's a backstory to all that. Uh, but just you talk about a guy that um, heart and soul and effort and, you know, it, it, you know, he would tap his chest and do the New York thing before, like that was a popular thing. He was just somebody that really you felt represented you as a fan represented the fan base um, and certain players just connect uh, with fans and the fan base more than others. And Starks was one of those guys. And that was the pinnacle, um, literally jumping over, you know, Horace Grant, Michael Jordan, um, reaching the summit of, of his career and, and his time as a Nick. Yeah, it was, it was an iconic moment. I mean, I was uh, two years old when this happened, so I don't remember anything. Obviously, I know I was with my dad probably because he was definitely watching this game. It's funny I, whenever I hear the stories about the dunk. One of the funny things I always think about is people always saying, "Oh, Starks dunked, dunked on Jordan," and I'm like, then I would go watch the video. I'm like, Jordan was like barely in the picture. He kind of jumped late and didn't really contest the dunk. He really he dunked on Horace Grant. I think that that's fair to say. But they always the Knicks fans, oh, remember when Starks went baseline and dunked on Jordan? That's anybody anybody telling a story about the dunk always had to mention that uh, Stark dunked on Jordan, even though mm -hmm. that didn't actually happen, which is just like just part of the fable, part of the legend of the story. I yep. love it. Every time I talk about it, it was like, oh, remember when Stark dunked on Jordan? So that part of it is funny. And to me, like that play, I think to me is like, is they're like it's distant cousins of the the Houston shot. Like I tell you guys how the Houston shot over Miami's in my is in my uh, apartment is hanging as well. Just like Tommy talked about the uh, having the dunk hanging right there uh, behind him. Like to me, those plays kind of just embodied those two Knicks '90s teams. Like they're different teams, but like I think if you think of like what play embodies that Knicks team of the early '90s, the Ewing led teams with Starks and Oakley and uh and 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 um and anthony mason and, and those guys that dunk i think is kind of the pinnacle when you think of the late 90s knicks teams and say what is the moment that kind of epitomizes that mo that team i think it's the houston shot over miami and it, it when i think about that series because so many will say that was the knicks best chance at beating chicago they were up 2-0 they were going to chicago and then it's crazy. Like Jordan had this really terrible game three, but Scotty Pippen dominated game three. So, and the Knicks kind of came in sleepwalking. And that was the game that the Knicks really need to get. I don't think they realized how important getting up 3 0 was against that team. And especially when you get Jordan shooting so poorly in game three, I think he shot like three for 20, something crazy in that game. Um, the fact that they didn't get that game kind of allowed the floodgates to open because then Jordan has 54 in the next game. Now, all the pressure is on you coming into game five. And of course, the nightmare. Of Charles Smith underneath the basket um, leads to uh, uh, you know the Knicks uh, losing that series. But it, to me, also when I think about the Stark Stark, it kind of reminds me of the Andy Chavez catch. Like nobody really even talks too much about the Knicks losing that series. People talk about Charles Smith, but what happened almost doesn't matter because the play is so spectacular and so iconic in itself that you can kind of separate not winning a championship with like how incredible that play was given the stakes and everything. Uh, Jordan was three for 18 in game three, but he was also, go. he was also 16 of 17 from the free throw line though. So yeah. that, that's kind of where he made his bones, but yeah, you know, Phil Jackson, um, uh, needling the refs talking about brass yeah. basketball and doing all the stuff he did. That certainly helped yep. him. Both yep, shot yep. 42 free throws in that game. Crazy. Um, Pippen <laughs> out of 12 shooting. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, I, I think that probably was their best chance to, to beat the Bulls. Um, you can make a case for, for previous years as well, but, um, obviously the Charles Smith nightmare and, 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 and the other situ, you know, the other stuff that went into it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, 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 I that that's that to this day it, it's it's still uh that that one still stings obviously um and charles smith gets too much blame but uh you're, you're right they had an opportunity in game three they should have won game yeah. five uh and then you would have felt confident them taking game seven at the garden at being someone who was watching those games and a fan of those teams are you among those who say that the knicks mistake was not bringing back xavier mcdaniel into that 93 team or do you feel like you know that was not as relevant because the 90 92 team Oh, did not win as many games in the 91 the, the 93 team was the number one seed in the east won 60 games uh the 92 team was a good team they only lost you know uh they only won they won 51 games but they did pick the bulls a seven games so they did actually challenge the bulls even further in that do you think that that was the kind of the 
the the, the move that kind of shifted the dynamics of the series between those two teams? I don't think so. Um, okay. I, listen, I, I thought McDaniel was obviously a key piece, a, a crucial piece. And it's difficult to kind of, you know, it's, it's funny when he asked me those questions, because now I would look at the plus minus the off, you know, the analytical yeah. side of it. Back then, you just kind of, you know, we didn't have access to the kind of the, the, the research and, and all the yeah. other stuff. You know, I would just read Newsday the day after the game, even though I, I knew what happened. That was really the only outside source of it. Maybe listen to Mike and the Mad Dog. You know, like those are the only ways and, and, and differing voices you had. You'd talk to my buddies, but, you know, some, you know, some kids watch sports, some kids don't. Some kids kind of just keep an eye on it and are familiar with the score or whatever. Uh, but it's amazing that kids nowadays have such access to um, a wide Absolutely. variety of voices and maybe for better, maybe for worse. I don't know. It's a fascinating question to kind of think about. Maybe we'll discuss it sometime this, this offseason. But um, you just kind of really had to sit with yourself and, you know, your close, you know, your couple close friends that you trusted and trust their opinions and some family members and, and stuff like that. Um, but there wasn't as, as you know, there wasn't pod, podcast that, that's, you know, yeah. we're talking more about that play and that you know, than probably in the in the 10 years after um, that yeah. actually happened, let alone the day after the night of, you know, imagine Twitter, imagine Twitter on the night of the dunk, you know, like it would just, you know, you think Nick fans go crazy for a, a regular season win on, uh, you know, on, on February or a yeah. win over the, the Cavs in round one. <laughs> um, think about beating Jordan in 1993. It's just, yeah. it's, it's almost, it's hard to fathom. Really. And I thought you really encapsulated well why Stark was so beloved by the fans because I often kind of wonder, you know, when we think of John Stark, people first think about the dunk, which is a little bit surprising considering you have two for 18 in game seven and 94 of the NBA finals, a, can, a ten team a game where the Knicks could have won and won an actual championship. And yet Stark seems to have like, people remember it, but like, that's not like the number one thing people will talk about when you think of John Starks. I think in many ways, a lot of it is because of the things you talked about, because he was a guy that truly was an orange and blue blood. He bled orange and blue. Yeah. Like this guy, um, you know, you know, you got the feeling that guys like Oakley and Starks and Mason, you guys would die on the court if it, if it meant yeah. they could get a win. You know, you know, it's John Starks. I'll never forget the, the video of him kissing the garden floor, kissing that logo uh, right at, at center court, like all those things. And then the underdog story about him being a guy who's bagging groceries, trying to just find an NBA roster and then working his way into the starting lineup, becoming a key contributor to the Knicks. I think, uh, him it kind of embodying what New York is about, overcoming adversity, not giving up, getting knocked down and getting back up, and sometimes having tough moments like a two for 18 with a chance to win the title, but knowing that, hey, he gave it his all, he gave it his best. And, and at, the end of the, at the end of the day, New York will love you for it. I think it's an important lesson to learn for someone like a Julius Randle, someone we were talking about, saying, hey, you it doesn't, we're not saying make every shot. You can be a legend here, you can be an icon here and not make every shot. It's about how you approach the game is about how you give it your all. And that's what the city respects. A hundred percent. I mean, and listen, I know Tibbs tells us he watches film, but you can't tell me. Julius Randle would not be allowed back on the floor. Forget about the head coach. Forget about the front office. Charles Oakley, Patrick Ewing, John Starks would not allow him to not try hard in any game, let alone a season elimination game um, in, in, in any yeah. playoff game. They just would not allow him to lollygag up and down the floor um, continuously. Um, one time it happens, you get frustrated, but the type of stuff we see again and again and again, and that kind of clouds the vision. So again, yeah, to your point, and I don't mean to pick on Randall in this spot, right. um, but yeah. it's, like, it's, it's like a – um, a, 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 an ex or a, a lost love, you know, you can remember the heartache of it, but if as long as you guys like split amicably and, you know, maybe you went to a different college and she went to a different college and, you know, just things happen, you grow and you're apart and just wasn't meant to be, you can still remember those amazing times, you know, like those, those high school years, those, those, you know, yeah. those, those first times, those first time falling in love stuff, you know, like all those, right. those flowers and rainbows and all that stuff. Whereas maybe, you know, as a 25 year old, you, you know, you're in a serious relationship and you're about to get engaged and then you find out she's cheating on you and you forget all the other good stuff and you can just, you know, this right. that, yeah. It's the it's the nasty toxic stuff that you you know that makes yeah. you sick and you, and you and that's all you can see you know so like somebody that you that you look that you want to that you choose to look back on finally you remember you know the 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 joy they brought you as opposed to the heartache um, and I think also um, 
the 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 pain that you could see in Starks. I, I actually I've had the opportunity to interview uh, Mr. Starks a couple of times, and I and, and and he's taught and he's talked about. I, I asked him specifically about Game Seven, um, and it was kind of hard, and you could see his face, you know. And he talked about he didn't watch it for like six months. He didn't he didn't he, you know he never watched the tape of the game. He talked yeah. to sports therapists, and then th he struggled for the first three months of the following season. Couldn't hit a shot, um, and he said yeah. it was messing with his mind. So he made he watched it. He watched it from start to finish. A sports psychologist recommended you know you, you're, you fear this bully because it's the unknown just watch it and maybe that'll help so he just went through a whole bunch of long story short it didn't take you know you don't have to talk to Starks to know that it ripped his heart nobody right. every Nick fans knew every Nick fan knew yes it it broke my heart but it was more painful for Mr. for Starks himself right. you know so like they could sense that and right. when you can sense right. that even like you talk about Randall like ah it's a learning lesson you know you know I learned we'll learn a little bit we'll be back no like there was no pre there was no pretense there um you know you could tell it was the most important game of his life and he failed miserably you know uh, prolifically on the biggest stage on the biggest game he'll ever play and that's something that he'll have to take to his grave with them and Nick fans knew that so it's almost like we don't need to, to to pile on that he understands that let's try to it's almost like let's try to lift him up because he because right. he he felt it like us I think as fans that's really what you want is a connection you want to you want to think at least and I think a lot of fans would be devastated if they knew how little certain players cared about the outcomes yes. of the contests exactly. um, um, but you want to hope that they care half as much as you do. And with Starks, you knew that he cared more than you do. So you almost want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest podcast ventures. Um, links will be in the descriptions. And as always, thanks for watching, and we will see you in our next video.